And good afternoon, or just, just about good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining us today. My name is Gillian Parker. I'm a senior manager at, um, on the policy and insights team at Economist Impact here in Singapore. And today we're here to discuss the soft uh, plastic pollution crisis. And I have great three great panelists with, with me today to discuss this. Uh, Short Fowser, Chief Executive from Archway. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Linda uh, Yanti uh, Sulistwati, Senior Research Fellow for Asia Pacific Center of Environmental Law at NUS, uh, the National University of Singapore. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome, Linda. And Stan Wan, Chief Executive of Piping Hot. Welcome. Yeah, thank thank you, you so much for joining Thanks. us today. So we're looking at the prevalence of soft plastics. So what do we mean by soft plastics? Those are the ones that you can scrunch up. So the plastic carrier bags, the bread, uh, bags of cereal bags, cling film, and, and so on. And this is a particular concerning aspect um, on the ongoing plastic crisis. On top of that, then you've got the ocean impact of um, polyester and other, other synthetic fibers, and that extends far beyond the, the production process. Um, ongoing at the moment is uh, our negotiations on the UN Treaty on Plastic Pollution. So it's rather apt that we're talking about this. And, and Linda, I'll probably uh, I'll open my the discussion with the first question on that. Are you hopeful that this the UN Treaty on Plastic Pollution can address this uh, problem of soft pollution, soft plastic pollution? Uh, hopeful, yes. So this is not like a baseless hope because uh, our center, Absel, did a research last year in 2021 uh, for Asian countries. Specifically, we went and interviewed 10 uh, countries that we can, you know, like catch and, and, and interviewed. But we also did like a desktop studies of uh, 16. So. Uh, these countries are very hopeful, uh, thinking that uh, a new plastic treaty would guide them to A, uh, building their leverage in terms of uh, confidence when they're talking to businesses. You wouldn't think that, but that's what happened. So government officials are feeling like when they're talking to big businesses and push for EPR, for example. There's no EPR yet in, in ASEAN, but hopefully soon, because like this um, uh, negotiation between government to business sometimes can also put burdens on these governments. Mm. Uh, second, they also think with a new plastic treaty, they, this would scale up their national targets. Mm. So bring them you know, forward and thinking that you know, this would also help uh, marine plastic pollution, but also land-based plastic pollution. So um, from what I heard, the processes in currently in Uruguay are doing really well. And, and people are saying this is like the next best thing after uh, the climate treaty, after Paris Agreement. Uh, so, but, and then on the other hand, we also think what has happened? <laughs> with the climate treaty. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, so it's, like, it's, a, it's a big, it's a big expectation. Mm. We have big expectation, but we also need to be also realistic. Mm. Like, like what has, has worked with the climate treaty, you know, maybe a, a lot of collaboration, a lot of talks, a lot of discussion, but also like in reality, we need to still pressure and push for, you know, better, uh, better implementations of whatever the governments have agreed, I think. I mean, there's in within the treaty discussions, they're talking about bans on single use plastic. You've mentioned EPR. Mm -hmm. um, which lever do you think is going to be most effective? Um, uh, EPR is definitely one of the things that the Asian countries highlighted that they want it to be in the new mm -hmm. treaty. Uh, we're hoping that um, because it's it's also very national of how EPR is going to work. Like in in Japan, it worked really really well since mm -hmm. I don't know twenty the two thousands, right? Yeah. Yeah. And in Korea, we also have examples. Mm -hmm. But like in in Southeast Asia, specifically in developing countries, that's where we have problems mm -hmm. um, because we don't know. First, there's a lack of data of of plastic pollution in developing countries in Southeast Asia and in ASEAN in general, 
right? And, and second, there's a, like a huge uh, like mismanagement in terms of plastic pollution, including soft plastic. We call it single-use plastic mm -hmm. because you only, you only use it once and then throw it away. And then third, there's also this misconception from developing countries' um, consumers thinking that these single-use plastics are cheap, clean, you know, and, and simple. Mm -hmm. There's no awareness yet of like how this would stay in your landfill for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, there's like multifacets of problems when we are talking about this mm -hmm. in the negotiating table. Yeah, absolutely, Linda. I think, I think the, the problem is seismic. Um, short. What what are your some of some of your solutions to to this to this crisis? Um, well, what Archway does is uh, recycling of plastics, so uh, high volume uh, recycling of plastics. Uh, the program is called Blue Wave, mm -hmm. and um, we have basically our own. Um, proprietary materials with the same characteristics of fossil fuel based plastics. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, w one of the problems uh, in the bigger scheme of things is fossil fuel mm -hmm. and is our dependency on oil in general. Um, but today we're talking about plastics. So um, uh, another part, so first of all, it's the, the dependency on oil. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it's education. Mm -hmm. um, if, if we go back in time, uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, uh, plastics was created uh, as a material to package more products in uh, the same amount of time and uh, basically to, uh, to consume faster. Um, not taking into consideration what virgin plastics uh, would do to our planet or what it would do uh, to our, let's say, ecosystems. Um, education is key mm. and uh, if we don't educate ourselves, uh, if we don't educate uh, our next generations, uh, we'll just keep on going around in circles. Mm. So um, that, that's, that's a crucial, crucial part, uh, followed of course by, by policies. Um, in Europe you see uh, the plastic tax and uh, it's been effective in uh, the UK, Spain, uh, Italy, uh, Germany following, uh, Japan uh, has had it for, uh, for quite some time, uh, Australia, California, so it's becoming a, a global thing, the plastic tax, where there are different percentages, but y you have to use recycled or import recycled plastics and not only fossil fuel based uh, virgin plastics, um, so that supports our Blue Wave program. Mm -hmm. Mm, okay, that's that's great to hear. I mean, I think this education aspect is an important part of this. Um, Stan, mm. perhaps you could educate us and, and tell us where this, uh, why this is such a big problem um, within the textile industry. Uh, we associate it with maybe some other problems, um, particularly human rights abuses and so on. Mm. Where is, is it? Why is this a problem in the textile industry? Well, I think. A lot of people don't understand that, um, again, with education, when you look at um, synthetics, right, which accounts for um, more than 60% of the global textile industry, and synthetics are largely um, petrochemical based, right? So they're fossil uh, fuel derived um, fabrications and they serve a purpose, right? You know, and when you look at swimwear, for example, which we're largely in as a, as a brand, um, you know, you have to keep the customers or the consumers um, warm. You got to keep them uh, dry. You have to give them UV protection, mm -hmm. um, uh, the elasticity retention. All this comes from um, the innovation uh, with a very tragic material called polyester. And I think that um, if you think about 20% of the water population in the world today comes from the textile industry and 60%, 35% of microplastic comes from um, fossil fuel um, uh, synthetic fabrications. So when people look and they purchase, I think that consumer education is really, really important. Mm -hmm. um, I think buying power you know, of consumers um, with um, government policies, I think, and governments can change things, mm. but um, 
I think I think right now, uh, when we look at um, fast fashion, for example, and the ability to reach consumers, direct to consumers, without policies, this is one of those things that is very, very difficult to regulate. And the supply chain already is this very complex, yeah. geographically, from raw materials to how we produce, how we logistically send it to retailers or to customers. Um, it's you know, there's a reason why it's the second most polluting industry in the world behind oil and gas. I mean, I have to say I'm, I'm a little bit cynical when it comes to, um, you know, when I see fast fashion brands saying that they're, you know, they're pledging to sustainability when, you know, they're selling sort of $2 vests. Absolutely. Um, yeah. You know, that cannot possibly capture the cost, the environmental yeah. cost of those products. So how do you, mm. how does, how do we start to turn the dial and really put the pressure on in terms of, exerting pressure on supply chains, on mm -hmm. manufacturers, surely that's where it has to begin. Yeah, look, I think, I think um, the, the fundamental root cause is the first thing, right? The biggest part of the problem is fabrication, right? Before anyone produces, before anyone, you know, makes, you know, within the supply chain where they put printing and they put coatings on it, the base material is the most important thing. So that is one of the biggest issues. So one of the problems to solve there is can we create more bio base solutions and which is something that we're doing right now with the University of Technology in Sydney in Australia is to create a bio base um, synthetic using um, algae. So this is, I think more companies need to invest in innovation. Um, the supply chain is already, we've already got a lot of manufacturers and factories are, I guess, on the journey. Right, and um, equally on the other side of the room, there are um, suppliers that are refusing to do it. They're still bottom line driven. And I think brands um, and businesses, retailers will just have to make the hard decision to say, you know, we're not going to use you and that's the end of it, not wait for a transition. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's where all the greenwashing comes in. It's difficult and retailers, the call outs that they are getting away with to favor profits, right, is, um, yeah, it's shameful. Yeah, and the attention seems to focus on the top, the top 20 firms that right. make the most money and that right. been sitting there in the past decade. Absolutely. Um, sure, how, what do you think, what would exert pressure and, and how do we sort of, you know, share some of that burden to address this crisis on, uh, on to sort of retailers and brands? Um, well, first of all, I don't think uh, making money is a bad thing. Um, be simply because of the fact innovation technology it all costs money so if we want to change things we need to uh, invest that money over a longer period of time to to actually see an effective change um, I think what we're talking about here all of us today is uh, decarbonization mm -hmm. and um, doesn't matter which let's say which process or um, which which business model you look at uh, everything has to be focused uh, in the upcoming 10 20 30 years on decarbonization and, um, and not solely on sustainability and it has to become uh, a a vital department in every corporate like finance like sales like operations like marketing uh, all important and established departments within any global operation. Um, that has to be the same for sustainability, decarbonization, where investments and funds have to be made available um, to, to actually execute those plans that are being brought to the table. So if you look at, <clears throat> if you look at the uh, research that, that we've recently done with, uh, with a Dutch university, uh, where we've looked at um, products uh, made out of plastics, uh, so made out of virgin plastics, the raw material uh, being uh, a derivative of oil. Mm -hmm. And then you look at blue wave recycled plastics and then the creation of the same product, the uh, CO2 um, emission or the decarbonization is 42%. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a big step. So I I if we, uh, as a business, and then I mean all corporates and all businesses uh, across the globe, really start looking at recycled plastics in uh, in our packaging or in the way that we use that material, uh, we'll, we'll see a decarbonization of our planet mm. uh, of 40% at least. And 
well, everyone knows this saying by now, but we only have one planet. I mean, you make a compelling case. Why isn't everyone doing it? <laughs> Those are compelling numbers. What's holding it back? Um, investment, mm. um, time, the clock. <laughs> um, but, but the clock in general, uh, I think that you know, we've known that uh, some of us have known that um, plastic made out of, let's say, thermo types of plastics uh, is recyclable, is reusable. Um, Archway is doing it, we're the living proof of it. Um, we've done about 32,000, 33,000 metric tons last year, uh, scaling up to uh, 65,000 metric tons uh, in the upcoming year. Um, and yeah, we started with the end in mind. So basically we started um, literally doing it and processing it and and, and compounding it and extruding it and creating uh, a newly used to be used material mm. um, and started commercializing that into various different types of products. Um, now we're starting to look at the whole, let's say social credits and the whole social part uh, around it. And then there is the blue wave and then in the future we'll be looking at the carbon credit. So once we've set out those three pillars as a whole, uh, and as part of Archway's mission, um, yeah, I think then, then we'll come a long way. But again, we're fighting the clock. Mm. Um, Linda, we've seen the rise in, in li climate litigation globally, for instance. There seems to be a, a rise in the tide against trying to pin, uh, pin the blame on people and, and, and hold them to account. Um, how might that replay and how might that work in, within this context of a plastic um, plastic crisis. Right. So when we're talking about climate litigation, it's actually easier to pin down who's responsible. When we're talking about like haze pollution, for example, you know where it came from, right? Mm -hmm. But with plastic, the main problem is that you don't know who's to blame, like who's liable in terms of, you know, uh, putting plastic specifically in the ocean. Mm -hmm. It can be, it can came from, I don't know, some sort of manufacturer in Canada, for example, but did they really put it in the ocean or it has swam around for many, many years, you know, floating until it comes to Asia Pacific? We never know. We have that huge garbage patch, it's called the huge garbage, Asia, like Pacific patch, because mm -hmm. it's like bigger than uh, the state of Arizona or something mm -hmm. like that. So it's huge here in, in Asia Pacific, but we don't know where they come from. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it's, it's really uh, hard in terms of uh, legal action of where to, you know, put the blame on. So uh, what they are discussing is that because it, you know, it's hard to find who is to blame, who, who's polluter that needs to pay for this specific yeah. pollution. And then what you do is that you're sort of saying, okay, it's everybody's problem then. Mm -hmm. When it's floating in the ocean, then it's everybody's problem because the, the ocean belongs to everybody. And then so who has to be responsible? The easier way out is states. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so states need to make sure that the territorial water, uh, it's, 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 it's their responsibility, responsibility, but also outside of their territorial water uh, becomes, you know, their common responsibility. Mm -hmm. So everybody is responsible. So, and then, and then, and then this is what has been done by states in the Asia Pacific, for example, the PEMC, the, the, the COPC. So they sort of take this into their, you know, own responsibility and trying to like clean uh, the plastic waste that they found in the regional area. But this goes back to the talk again in UNEA, right, in Uruguay. This is part of where states need to come together and sort of put their foot down mm. and say, you know, uh, this is not just states that needs to do this, but everybody else too, 
right? It's the responsibility of, of the producer, the consumers, and, 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 and people who put things into their landfill and not being responsible for the leakage and all that. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, um, uh, I think the new treaty will give us, you know, not only hope, mm -hmm. but also give us like access to technological things that you already have in other parts of the world mm -hmm. into this region, right? And also uh, give us like a, a, a harmonized design that's not too dangerous, mm -hmm. the single-use plastic or soft plastic as you're saying, mm -hmm. because we don't have that specifically in developing countries in, 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 mm -hmm. in some region in, of the world, including us. Uh, but also, most importantly, Jillian, is the the uh, harmonization or the, the, the one system of monitoring, mm -hmm. reporting, and verification. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because that would put us in the same page, yeah. like saying, okay, this is what we have reached in the first year, this is what we have reached in the second year, and third year, mm -hmm. etc. cetera. So uh, I think that's, that's also one of the keys uh, when we're talking about the new treaty. I mean, compliance is going to be mm -hmm. a slight issue here, um, and enforcing some of these uh, um, these ideas that are being brought up. Have you got any sort of? Are you seeing any glimmers of hope in terms of how that might actually play out? Um, following, I mean, it's all great having all of these ideas on paper, but how right. do you put it into practice? In terms of compliance, I think the new treaty will sort of mimic what we have in the climate treaty. Uh, uh, naming and shaming is, is somehow very, very powerful when we are talking about, you know, states and, you know, their images uh, uh, in the world. Uh, but also, secondly, I think, you know, just as powerful is public pressures <laughs> and media pressures. I think whatever it is that gets published in, like, big media like the economics, for example, people read it and then they quote it everywhere. Mm -hmm. And it just gives, you know, uh, a whole lot of, uh, uh, not just pressure, but also responsibility mm -hmm. toward the states and also stakeholders when we are talking about, you know, the MPP, the marine plastic pollution. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, Stan, I've got a question, I think it's probably directed to you, but what technology mm. already exists to recycle and reuse textiles from used clothing around the Asia Pacific where this can't be resold through um, second-hand shops, for instance? I think when you look at um, recycled clothing, I mean, that's a you know, fantastic opportunity for retailers to mm. you know, um, be accountable for their end-of-life um, cycle. <laughs> But I think that there is not yet enough transparency in what mm -hmm. they actually do to it, right? So we've all been, you know, um, guilty of going to retailers to, you know, put back, you know, used clothing there. But where does it go? How does it get recycled, right? So when it when when you look at garments and they are mixed materials, you're not mono materials, right? So if you have polyester and cotton, the technology in abundance is not there yet mm -hmm. to separate for um, recyclability. I mean, every time you recycle, though, um, um, uh, it loses an element of tensile strength as well. So mm -hmm. um, technology is there. I mean, like everyone's doing, I think, you know, Archway, for example, is a good example of, you know, um, um, leading right in this area. Um, but when you look at the resale industry, that's starting to prop up. But that really is in the luxury sector or in the quality sector, right? Mm -hmm. So when you talk about big, you know, um, brands that is fast fashion now, there, there's no secondhand aspect to it, mm. you know, so. There's definitely a trust issue it here. Is. We've seen a lot of these stories pop up um, yeah. recently. I mean, I, uh, even sitting, I used to work in West Africa, there's the amount of clothes that would come from mm. the UK was, was insane. I mean, right. Sure. This is a this is also a problem with the collection of, of single-use plastic. We're seeing mm. um, some issues of it from Coles and Woolworths in Australia, where you know they've been sort of stockpiling mm. uh, plastic, and this seems to be a recurring issue. How do we collect and process this this single-use plastic, and how do we really instill that trust? Is there is there anything that you can comment on that? Yeah, that's one of the hardest questions. <laughs> um, so I think. You know, unfortunately, uh, the, the past couple of years, um, we, we've been, or we, I mean, 
let's say, the United States, Europe, transporting uh, waste to China uh, until uh, 2018, after uh, 2018 to other different countries in, uh, in Southeast Asia. And um, again, it comes back to an earlier point because we need to invest and uh, we need to invest in uh, recycling facilities. We need to invest in infrastructure and uh, we need to invest in people. And once we get all those dots connected um, and a, a continuous flow of uh, material inflow, uh, and then in our case, reprocessed into, uh, into blue wave material, from there on, we can redistribute uh, re recycled plastics. So uh, infrastructure is very important and investment is very important. Um, alongside of, of working with, uh, with local governments mm -hmm. and um, companies or, or, or leadership teams of companies who simply don't take no for an answer. And uh, um, basically they get up every morning and um, uh, they believe in what they do and, and they give it 100% and they, they push boundaries and they keep on pushing boundaries until they get what they want. Mm. Uh, I think that, that that's a very important part and that's the human part of, uh, of bringing this all together. Mm. Just want to pause there. I want to ask the audience very quickly. You've all got your wavy signs, I think, on your, on your <laughs> <laughs> chairs. I want to know how many people intentionally set out, when they're buying clothes, intentionally set out to buy sustainable, la sustainably labelled clothes? Um, okay, we've got a yes, yes. Okay. And how many people have recycled either textiles, either clothes or shoes? So we've brought them back to the... Okay, so everyone. All right. Uh, a couple of no's. Okay, you should, you should recycle. <laughs> um, Can I ask a question? Yeah, please do. Good question. <laughs> um, so next time any, any of the people here uh, today, you go, uh, you go shopping for, uh, for groceries or, or for, uh, let's say, any of the items uh, uh, packed in, pla in, in plastics, uh, in the future, uh, if you see Blue Wave at the bottom, or if you see Blue Wave or Archway or anything in that sense there on the Archway. packaging, good to go. <laughs> I don't know if that was a question. Yeah. <laughs> it was direct marketing. Is it? <laughs> um, perhaps we could take a question from the floor. Does anyone? Uh, yes, we've got a roving microphone. Thank you, Jazz Chambers from Ocean Decade Australia. Um, thanks for the conversation. I'm interested, um, two of you have mentioned uh, R&D, actually investing um, in science and research uh, to go for new materials. And uh, having worked in the research sector myself, I know how hard it is to put those deals together. I'd be really interested to get your perspectives on how do you do that? How do you invest in that? What are the hallmarks of a good deal, a win-win-win for the research, the university, the researcher and the business? Stan? Yeah, look, um, I, I think the first thing is um, you have to work in with, um, you know, not just academia to find a, um, a paper solution, right? So I feel that you have to work closely with them to understand that it needs to be scalability. If there is no scalability in it, it's just a great invention and, you know, you can't solve any problems. So I think for my experience in our example with UTS in, um, uh, in, in Australia is that they're a algae, um, you know, biotechnology leadership with um, Professor Peter Ralph. And, you know, he told me a small story. Um, um, I hope he doesn't mind me sharing it, but um, he was Dr. Death a long time ago. He was saying, there's, you know, every, the planet's dying, da, da 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 But after the situation with um, Greta, you know, um, and so the new, um, I guess, emerging, you know, um, leaders coming out, he said, look, we, he's got to change his views. So he became, because industry was always seen as the devil, right? And um, so you have to select, in answering a question, you have to select, you know, what problems you're going to solve and um, really be, invested in it and you have to chase them you have to work together it's a collaboration and um you know uh, and the business also has to be profitable you know so um i think you have to specialize so for us you know we're, we're looking to transform um 
um, polyester because it's the biggest issue on our planet at the moment in terms of petrochemical um, synthetics. So yeah, so we're on that journey now. With Okay, Linda, do you want to add anything to that funding research in a, in a university? I'm sure this is something that you're <laughs> struggling with. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think it's very important because with research, then we understood, you know, which part that we are lacking. And, and, and in terms of uh, uh, putting it in, in the new treaty, I think um, what we need to highlight is not just uh, access to technology and research, but also access to finance, because that's what the developing countries really need. Um, and and the fact that you know in in the Big Ten of 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 the most polluting plastic polluting countries in the world mostly come from Asia, mm. right? And, and 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 people are blaming the region as if you know we're producing so much pollution, but you know, essentially the pollution came from somewhere else too. Like, like China has to, you know, close their border from uh, plastic waste. And now all this plastic waste came to Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, and the Philippines. And then the Philippines became number two plastic polluter country. So it's, it's essentially, you know, essentially it's not a fair world. But with, you know, hoping, my hope is with this new treaty, uh, it's sort of like uh, putting everybody in the spotlight. Because, you know, uh, hopefully uh, money doesn't buy everything, but it can solve things too, mm -hmm. hopefully. Well, hopefully it'll look at the whole life cycle and look yeah. at, if you're looking at the top, they don't say it. <laughs> okay, uh, perhaps uh, another question from the floor. Yes, please. Hi there. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Hi, um, Helga van Turnut from ADM Capital Foundation out of Hong Kong. Um, in the beginning of the panel, we made a comparison between the, the plastics treaty and, and, and what we're doing around carbon. And, and Linda uh, cautioned, let's get our hopes up, but not too much because this is taking a while. If we similarly look at the corporate side, and you know, we've been discussing climate for decades, there's still a lot of companies out there that don't have a full-fledged carbon agenda or a plan for what they're gonna do about their own uh, scope one and two, let alone scope three emissions. How realistic is it to get car, uh, uh, corporates uh, developing a plastics agenda? Like a real, not just you know scratching at the surface or replacing a little bit here and there, but really a thought out full agenda. Um, and then I guess a, a, an add-on question is how do you see the opportunities for um, plastic credits in that short term, mid term, long term? And like, how do we get the good ones in, but uh, also phase them out over time? Short. Sorry, that's a really hard question. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, first of all, my personal opinion, uh, hope is not a strategy. Um, it, yeah, yes, uh, I mean, uh, we can all talk, but uh, at, at the end of the day, uh, we'll all have to uh, roll up our sleeves and, uh, and get our hands dirty, uh, in some cases, literally. Um, but, but I think the answer to this on a, on a global scale lies with, um, with, with shareholders, um, with boardrooms, um, uh, and, and also listed companies who, who, have, uh, who, who might have shareholders like you, Gillian, me, anyone uh, here today. Uh, if we educate ourselves and if we speak up, eventually over time uh, we will drive or, or enforce change uh, top down. Uh, because I believe that this is a situation that has to uh, be managed uh, top down. I think we'll, uh, oh, maybe just one last question. And we'll bottom up, someone said, yes, correct. Bottom up, thank that, you. That would be <laughs> even better because then we meet halfway. Yeah. <laughs> Just the last question from our audience. Thank yeah. you. I'm there. Eric. I'm from the Philippines. Hi, Eric. And uh, I've been in the packaging business for four, 40 years. So I've seen it from the time when returnable glass was 90%, whether it's a formal returnable system or an informal one, when people pick up glass, they wash it and sell it again. 
nowadays, uh, the big problem is PET bottles, water bottles. In the Philippines alone, I estimate easily, 10 million daily are consumed out of 110 million Filipinos. Mm -hmm. But you see, in Manila as well, in Singapore, Sydney, you can drink from the faucet. But why is it consumers are so enamored in bringing or buying water bottles, which could have been brought from the home? So what's the big secret that people do not trust their water when it is supposed to be guaranteed up to the meter, of course, if your piping is shot, then you should drink shot water. So this is not more of a question, but an awareness that if we do something collectively, it's a low-lying fruit to shift from plastic water bottles to bring your own water wherever you go. So I think that's one major focus because it's the elephant in the room that we do not see. I think that's a great point, access to clean, safe water is perhaps underestimated in, in a lot of places. Um, and that's a great point to end on. Thank you. Um, and thank you to Stan, Linda Short, for your, your great insights today. And thank you to our audience for your questions. Please stay tuned. We're going to continue this conversation on plastic. Thank you.